has come. Um, today is going to begin a series. This is going to be an important day for us because this is this is a day of change in in Unity of Las Vegas. For about five months now, I've been here, and for this first five months, to tell you the truth has been leading up to today. That's kind of what it's been about. Because today, this ministry, and, I, and I'm assuming the vote's going to go in a very positive way towards the adoption of our new vision, mission, and core values and bylaws. Because there has been no, we have been talking about it for a couple of months almost, and nobody has really voiced any opposition to it. So, so we're just assuming that that's, that's going to show up in the vote, you know, and that we're going to be able to move that. But once that happens, we're going to start doing a, a, a significant amount of planning and strategic planning, thinking about how do we actually live this out, because that's, that's what we're about doing. We're about living this out, and, and it, we're, I'll talk a little bit about that more, but what it is, is I, is I believe, I believe, and many of us are on the spiritual path, many of us who are, you know, around the world participating in this approach, approach to spirituality and and many of us who are aware probably something that Charles Fillmore wasn't as aware of as we are becoming now aware of the evolutionary nature of our universe it is changing it is continually changing and it is continually growing into new experiences I don't know about you but when I was a child um, and, and a young person I pretty much thought that I'm a human being the way that all human beings are and the way that all human beings have always been. And that we showed up, according to what they told me, you know, we showed up on the planet fully formed as human beings. That's what God did, according to, you know, the, the interpretation of the Bible that I was taught as a young person, you know. And then somebody come along and says, we evolved from monkeys. Well, you know, that bothered me a great deal. But then, as I grew up and as I began to understand that we evolved in a process, a creative process of life that has been going on on this planet for five billion years. And we have our part of that process. We are at this point where the process is. This is where it is. And it has been doing this. And in the context of that, all of life has been the creative activity of some divine presence that is active in this universe that is producing us not for people who show up on the universe but as the universe becoming self-aware i am made up of of the universe i am actually literally made of stardust not figuratively and not metaphorically literally made of stardust the carbon that makes up my DNA was produced inside of the belly of stars. Didn't exist in the beginning. And when these stars died and exploded, they put this carbon out into the universe and the DNA, the atoms, the carbon atoms in my DNA existed in the belly of large stars. I am literally made of stardust. In that context, then we begin to see that, that God didn't make monkeys and then we evolved from monkeys, that God is the presence of life that has been active for this whole time in the universe. And in the context of that, there have been thresholds. Humanity and human consciousness has experienced thresholds. The imagination threshold, the evolution of the, of the, of the modern human brain happened somewhere around 120,000 years ago when imagination became a, a, a characteristic, unprecedented in the history of life on our planet. And out of that, we evolved out of that. One of the things that happened during that time also is the awareness that imagination was informed by basic survival instincts. And so the experience of separation, the experience of, of fear and anxiety were part of the motivations or the use of the imagination. And the result of that is, is what we all know about. The result of that is a human history across the board. Indigenous peoples, 
all peoples, a human history of anxiety and war and, and all kinds of suffering that has been created when the fear-based human sense of self informs the imagination, this new experience of imagination that we had. But also we inherited the answer and the solution to that, which is the spiritually awakened heart. And that's what we are about. Um, is about awakening the heart, awakening to our heart, not getting rid of our head and our mind. It's not going away. It's just that our heart, the presence of divine life and love in our heart begins to inform what? There's a question. Our what? Our brain. Our brain. Our imagination. Our brain. Our imagination. <laughs> exactly. Our brain. And so what happens is, is in the context of that, all of a sudden, our brain, we are not imagining all of the things that we can do in order for me to um, ensure my self-interest, which has nothing to do with yours, to ensure my self-interest is, is looked after. And if that is at the expense of yours, well, that's kind of the way it goes, you know. That's, but that's not the way that it's going to go from now on. Is as because that's what causes suffering and, and this experience that so many of us have in human life. So what we're doing is awakening to another truth, to a heart reality in which we are all connected. My self-interest is not separate from you or anybody else's on this planet or any other form of life on this planet. It is connected to all of that. That's what my heart tells me. And what my heart also tells me is there is a possibility to live that way in an unprecedented state of truth, beauty, and goodness in life that has never happened before. We can do more of that than ever before as we awaken to that. So that, Jesus called that good news. He said, that's the kingdom of God. That's pretty damn good news, folks. If that can come about, we're going to be in good shape with that. That's going to be helpful. So, so, and that is a threshold that we are currently at. And we're experiencing that threshold. And the reason it's a threshold is in the last 30 or 40 years, we have become a global community, whether we like it or not. We just have no choice about it. We are a global community, you know, and, and Google is the name of our brain. <laughs> kind of a thing <laughs> like that, you know. But, but we are at that point where we're a global community, and that's kind of what we're about. So that's what unity is about, and that's what the evolution of unity and the evolution of our new mission and vision and set of core values is, is, is about. Is about supporting that experience and playing our role in doing that. So, um, Las Vegas, uh, Unity of Las Vegas, transforming lives through unity, a positive path for spiritual living. These are the core values, and these are I'm going to be talking about these for the next few Sundays. It's what we're going to be voting on, um, and some uh, this, this afternoon, and some of these have existed beforehand. But these are the core values: spiritual awakening, freedom from suffering, as a core value. As and if fundamentally, if anything that Jesus did is what? He relieved suffering. He just went around everywhere he saw it. People came to him who were suffering, and he had the answer to relieving it, not only in the healing of illnesses and some of those kinds of things, but in, in, in awakening a state of mind that can re drastically reduce the amount of suffering that human beings experience at the, from, from each other, from the way that we interact with others. Um, integrity, joyfulness, inclusiveness, and stewardship. And we'll talk about all of those things as we go on. So, but all of these are a are, are result from spiritual awakening, and all of these are things that are going on in unity. Unity has five basic principles, and unity just produced a little video um, about the five principles of unity. So we're going to take a moment and look at that, and Shannon's going to start that video for us. Shannon? In the same way you build stuff out of blocks, we are made of spiritual stuff. We are all divine by design. The five unity principles help us understand this idea. One tells us that God is all good and is in everything, everywhere. Two tells me that as a child of God, I am good because God is good. Three says that I create my experiences by what I choose to think and feel and believe. This is why it is important to think positive thoughts about myself and other people. The fourth principle says that through affirmative prayer, I connect with God and bring out the good in my life. 
The fifth and final principle is that I do my best by living the truth I know. By living these spiritual truths, we <coughs> make the world a better place. Okay. This was produced um, partly with the Templeton grant, John Templeton, who was, who was, I don't know if any of you heard of him, but the Templeton Funds, he was one of the wealthier men in the world a number of years ago and left a foundation, and he was a, a great advocate of unity, and, um, and we are recipients frequently of some of their grants, and that's what that, that was made from, that particular little video. That is on our Facebook page. And probably will soon, be, hopefully, be on, also on, on our internet, our website. But we encourage you to really look at our Facebook page. It isn't getting a lot of activity lately, but there are regularly things that are going on there. There are kind of the transformational stuff, um, some of the stories of people who have found unity. So just take a look at our Facebook page and, and encourage other people. If you know somebody who you would like to um, like them to see that little short video on what unity is about. Encourage them to look at the Facebook page or show them how to find it on the Facebook page. So it's important. So spiritual awakening, that's the first core value, and that's what I'm going to like to talk a little bit about today. Um, and, and, and there are varieties, lots of ways that spirit, people get spiritually awake. And one of the unique things about having a genuine spiritual awakening, if it really is genuine for you, it is authentic and very real. And we have a tendency to say then, that's the kind of only real spiritual awakening there is because it's the only real one I experienced. So it is real. And obviously, if it's right for me, it probably must be right for you. And that may not be right. <laughs> it may not be right for you. But we tend to do that sometimes. And so, and so what I would propose to you is there are as many ways paths to spiritual awakening. There are as many paths to spiritual awakening as there are individuals. And, and, but in the context of that, so how we do that, whether we do that, I tend to do it much through my mind. I like to understand things. People do it through body experiences. People do it through energy experiences. People do it through all kinds of different experiences. Some people have flashes of, of real spiritual awakening. Other people have the educational kind, where it's a growing experience. So all of them, none of them are wrong, and all of them can be val val um, validated or be valid. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, but one of the things they have, they have a number of things in, con in, in common. One of them is a breakdown of previous worldviews and belief systems. That happens with all spiritual awakenings, and the reason being is that spiritual awakening is bringing us to a threshold, a new level of consciousness that we are evolutionarily designed to experience. And in the context of that, some of the old ways of thinking and being work, don't work out. I did a 90-day um, juice and silence fast once. It's a number of years ago I did this. And, and um, one of the things that happened, I did that fast, I did that because I was concerned about a, a, a thing from the Bible I was teaching and whether or not it was really true. And, and it was this thing that, in which Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do even greater works than these. And I thought to myself, not me. I'm not doing any greater works than Jesus. I'm not turning any water to wine, you know, or walking on water or raising the dead or healing the sick and things like that. And I don't know anybody else who is doing that as well consistently. I hear of experiences of those things. But I don't know anybody who is across the board doing that consistently. And I need an answer. If that isn't the, if that, if, if that isn't the truth, I'm not going to continue to stand up here at the podium in a unity church and say it is the truth if it isn't. If I'm going to be dishonest, I'm going to do it in a job that pays better than this one. <laughs> so, so I need it. So if I'm going to continue to be a uni minister, I, it has to be from a place of authenticity in me, not from a place of I hope everybody believes what I'm telling them, kind of a thing like that. So I went in that fast and I asked the question, what's the deal on that? 
And the answer that came to me about 45 days into the experience, as I was walking down a dirt road, is that the, the, the elements that make up human nature, the power that Jesus had, is only given to human beings who have evolved to the place where it is no longer possible for them to abuse power. Because that power is used at your own discretion, any way you want to use it. But it's just like a, just like a boy. I would have liked to have the, the keys to the car when I was 10 years old. I would have liked to have them. And I was pretty sure I could handle it. But somebody knew I wasn't, right? <laughs> and I didn't get the cars at 10 years old. It's the same thing as the power that Jesus had. This power that, that we call divine power is only given to you when the elements of human nature, when you've transcended or transformed the elements of human nature in which you would have, could, have, could conceivably abuse it. And then the next thing that says, and Barry, you're not there yet. <laughs> you can still abuse the power. And I knew it was right. I knew I had the capability of getting angry and resentful or whatever, getting threatened, and I could abuse power. But then the question came to my mind, why? Why am I all in the place why am I the kind of person that somehow I inherited the potential to abuse power? How did that happen? And then the, the answers that came to me is the characteristics, those elements of human nature that are no longer working were essential at earlier stages of evolution. They worked and they were essential. But now with the, with the emergence of human imagination, Many of those characteristics are no longer useful, not only no longer useful, but they now create all kinds of extraordinary levels of suffering. And so the process is the evolution of human nature in order that we then discover, which I believe we will as human beings if we make it as a species, those kinds of powers that we have to live even much more successfully than we ever have. And so it's a breakdown of previous worldviews and belief systems. And that's what those are that we inherit. And, and we do it all the time, and we can see it already. We're capable of, of reproduction when we're, what, 13, 14 years old. But we now put it off until what? Until at least our 20s now, usually, or even sometimes 30s. We put it off. So we are capable of transcending the way that we are, in, we are evolutionarily programmed. And that's what we're called to do with spiritual awakening. And so all genuine spiritual awakening experiences have this thing in, in common in which they transcend previous belief systems or worldviews with the new worldview. So the, the worldview that says I'm separate from yours and, and you're my separate self-interest is not connected to yours is transcended by a different reality that I awake to. Second, the emergence of a transcendent self and a divine sense of purpose. So, and what happens too is, is there is in me the capacity that when I'm experiencing something to not completely identify with the experience. There's a capacity for me to stand back and watch me have the experience. I can say, you know, I can, I can say, uh, um, I could just in conversations recently with somebody, I could say the words, I am depressed. And if I say I am depressed, I am identifying with the experience of, of depression as a reality, as my reality. That's who I am. I am depressed. But if I say, I can see myself feeling depressed. I'm watching myself feeling depressed. I'm having the feelings. They're not going away right now at least. They're still there. I'm having them. But I'm also watching myself have them. There is somebody inside of me capable of watching myself have these experiences. That's a component of spiritual awakening. The capacity to disconnect from all of these physical circumstances, as not as, as a part of our life, but as ultimate reality. To say they are no longer ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is another place inside of me, a place of truth. I can see myself having all the good and bad experiences. And, and so that's the, the emergence of a transcendent self and then a divine sense of purpose. What also emerges in spiritual awakening is, is the sense 
is the, is the emergence of the reality that we begin to suspect that the presence of God is not separate from us. That we are actually the presence of God. And in the context of that, what does God need to do on this planet? That's a question. And that question begins to take on a different meaning when it says, what do I need to do on this planet? Because I am the presence of God. What do we need to do on this planet? Because we are the presence of God. And then that question begins. And so a new sense of purpose beyond I still need to make a living. I still need to be reasonably successful at whatever I'm doing. But there is another reason for that. It's because I'm awakening to the truth that the presence of God is in me. And this presence of God in us is God answering the prayers of humanity. Next is a reduction in fear, an increase in wisdom and compassion, a love for self and others. And so that's another thing that's in common with all people who, have, who are having spiritual awakenings. Now, all of these don't happen in a flash, so you're completely there. They're what are emerging in us as we awaken spiritually. We're having, starting to experience these things in greater and greater degrees. And so the reduction in fear, the fear that there's something inherently wrong with me, there's a, now a reality inside that says there's nothing inherently wrong with me, but I did inherit some some experiences of human nature, no question about that. But they're my job to take them on and then transform or transcend them, and and support and be in relationship with you as we together move forward. So I am no longer afraid that I am defective and incapable and not enough and all of those kinds of things. All those fears go away. I begin to have a sense of compassion for myself, for how I've inherited human nature, and for how you have had it, that experience. And it, it keeps me from being as resentful as I used to get about you being wrong, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing like that. Because I was pretty good at that, you know, and, and that begins to decrease in that. And my compassion and love for myself and others increases. And then a heart, heightened sense of heart-mind connection to everything a heightened sense of the threshold in which my mind is still as active as it always has been. But now my heart, the place inside of me that knows I'm connected to everything, it is becoming as important, if not more important, in how I respond to the conditions of life. So, so those are things that are in common, all the different ways we can spiritually awaken. But you, can you see that those are the things that people who are waking up spiritually are having these experiences? These are the, the consciousness, the states of mind and heart that are developing in the people who are waking up. So, so that's what it is. So I'd like to share with you um, nine kind of ways. There are different ways that we experience spiritual awakening. And, and in these, um, some of them are unique to us as individuals. What, as I share these nine, what I'd like you to do is see if there's one or two in these nine that really speak to you. That say, yeah, this is what I'm about. I can feel this or sense that this is kind of, kind of how I am experiencing the awakening that I'm having. Number one is to awake to the perfecting active of, activity of spirit as it calls us to greater experiences of truth, beauty, and goodness. There's some of us that will awaken that and say, you know, the, I, what I really connect with it is this perfecting living presence of God as it seeks to make everything truly right. And, and the, the experience of rightness is a heartfelt experience, not a condemning experience. I condemn you because you're wrong or myself because I'm wrong. But it is the presence of something that says inside of me is the capacity to really live the best possible way, the, the rightest way. So that's number one. Number two, awake to the deep rewards of giving to others in ways supporting the spiritual awakening of more and more human beings. So some of us will really connect with that, the idea that to be spiritually awake, I really have to give to others. It really is important for me, and it's important for me to give in ways that are both appreciated and that actually make a difference in people's lives. Not in ways that just make me feel good and feel superior, but in ways that really make a difference. And so some, some people will awaken. Um, as they spiritually awaken, they'll awaken that capacity and that possibility in them. Number three, to awake, awake to one's capacity to embody and demonstrate the unlimited possibilities of successful spiritual living. Some of us are really, really um, drawn 
to creating successful experiences of life. Where we, we, we're continually looking for new things that we can be complete at, that we can be successful at, and that we can help other people be successful. And so that that idea of successful living and being able to embody that and being able to give it full expression becomes a really important part for some people. So, number four, to awake to one's potential to reduce suffering by being a unique blessing to people in need of spiritual awakening. So there are some people that really that really have a, a highly developed sensitivity to the suffering that human beings experience, and also have a highly developed or developing capacity to be uniquely present in ways that reduce that suffering for others and allow them to transcend that and move into a new state of spiritual awakening to who they are and what they what they're really meant to be. And that and, and some of those people having taken on that kind of experience has been a difficult time for them to take that on. But as they awaken spiritually they begin to see it as a blessing, as are all of them. Number five, to awake to a useful knowledge and understanding of how everything in the universe is connected in oneness and love. That's the one that I really relate to. trying to even gain more understanding and more knowledge about how, how all this universe is connected together. And so so I talked about it more than I probably should on Sunday morning because I am so interested in it because that thing really generates you know some excitement and enthusiasm in me. So and then number six to awake to the many ways one can serve the ultimate authority of divine creative life, love, and God. And there are some people that are that are genuinely, intensely looking for an authority that they can trust. And an authority then that they can give themselves in service to because, because they believe in it, because they believe that it is right. And, and those people, when they discover through spiritual awakening that, that that authority is the presence of God inside of them and the presence of God inside of you, and to serve the emergence of that is, is a great experience for people who are awakening in that perspective, in that frame of mind. And then seven, to awake to the unlimited opportunities to join with others in creating new joy and excitement living. Well, there are some people... That's just what they want to do. I mean, life is for creating good times, exciting times, new things that are going to be fun, that are going to create bliss, are going to really create a positive experience of life. There are people that, that's who I am. That's what they'll say. That's what I'm about, and that's what I like doing. And by God, when I'm awake, I'm going to do more of it. By God. <laughs> right? Okay, and then number eight, awake to one's ability to lead, inspire, and organize efforts to advance the spiritual awakening movement. There are people who just, who are born to kind of with a sense of being in charge. And when they're awake, they understand that it's not just being in charge because then I'm in control and people see me as powerful. It's being in charge because I am good at organizing and pulling people together and mentoring people as they awaken to this new reality that they are in. And spiritually awake, they look for every opportunity to be able to do that. And then number nine, awake to one's ability to transform differences into divine expressions of unity and diversity. So so, so these are the peacemakers in the world, that, that as they awaken to this presence inside of them, they are no longer afraid of conflict because they have awakened their power to transform conflict into expressions of diversity and beauty and wonder and all the things that we're about. So, so can, can any of you, do you think that you could, um, that one or two of those kind of spoke to you in any kind of a way? So, okay, well, I'd have you raise your hands, but I'm not going to do it, and I can't see them anyway because of those lights, so, <laughs> so I don't do that. <laughs> but hopefully that's what it is. And then if, you, if, if, if what you have done is you've seen this, um, if you've had some experiences with the Enneagram, um, you probably recognize this, that that's kind of part of the Enneagram teachings and what it is. And, and, so, the, and so that's based on that, the core value of spiritual awakening as the first core value that we're exploring in, in unity as part of unity of Las Vegas. 
this is what we're about. This is a fundamental belief that we hold that's the spiritual awakening of people in all of its diverse ways is what we are really about. That's why we exist. And so that's what that's about. Then we look at our vision. Our vision is, is, is congruent with Unity Worldwide Ministries vision, which is a world powerfully transformed through the shared spiritual awakening of all humanity. And that's an acknowledgement of the threshold that I talked about earlier. That the spiritual awakening threshold that transcends and transforms the human ego that allows us to use this extraordinary power of creative imagination that we have and we're not losing, to use that power in ways to reduce suffering and create good. So that's what the vision is, a world properly transformed through the shared spiritual awakening. Because it's the shared use of the imagination under the ego that creates all the suffering, is it not? I mean, it takes more than two people to create a nuclear weapon. And it takes a whole lot of people to use some of those kinds of things. It takes a whole lot of people to, to do, you know, some of us we don't like to look at, but in the last hundred years, there have been 50 experiences of genocide on our planet. That's a lot. Millions of people die nightmarish deaths because, uh, because human nature needs to transcend the experience of separation and fear in the use of its imagination. That's what we're about. That's what we're about doing. Our mission then is to advance the movement that calls humanity to spiritually awaken to oneness with each other and all creation. So that's what that's what we're about doing. So so as we after we adopt and officially adopt our vision, mission, and set of core values, then we're going to move into how we actually do that. How what we do in order to um, bring this about. And the good news is, is it affects us individually. We don't lose the need that we have for the spiritual experience to have a positive effect on our life. This is what um, Abraham Hicks says. The universe does this thing where it aligns you with people, things, and situations that match the energy you put out. The more you improve yourself and raise your vibration, the more you will see things that are beneficial to your well-being. So we don't lose self-interest. Self-interest never goes away, and it shouldn't go away. Self-interest is always there, but the reality of self-interest is, is when you wake up spiritually, you wake up to a vibration, and we wake up to a vibration in which all of a sudden I begin to notice circumstances and situations and events and all people and all kinds of things that enhance the quality of my life. I begin to see them and notice them and find a way to connect with them and the result is, is I experience prosperity and peace of mind and a very positive way of living. Not because I'm genuinely overpowering my ego, but what an ego being my fear that I'm fear of lack, I'm not gonna have enough. What I'm doing is not overpowering it, I'm transcending it this, with, with a state of mind that allows me to, to use my imagination, not informed by lack, but by informed by the truth of who I am. And in that state of vibration, I find myself in the kinds of experiences that say, that make me grateful for the, for the life I'm having. So that's what that's about. Part of what we'll do also do, some of the things we may do in the future, is connect with other organizations in the community 